given the conditions for a deadlock to happen, given these four conditions, which must happen simultaneously, uh, deadlocks can actually happen in an operating system, especially the kernel, wherein you have uh, a lot of uh, shared data structures that is being shared by different uh, parts of the kernel or kernel threads. And uh, because of that, uh, the deadlocks can occur via system calls, locking, and uh, other scenarios. For example, uh, we discussed about thread synchronization, the use of uh, locks to be able to perform uh, synchronization or cooperation. Now, an incorrect uh, usage of these uh, primitives, locking primitives, can actually result to uh, deadlock as long as these conditions will happen or will be true simultaneously. As shown here, so you have here two threads and uh, thread one, do work one, thread two, do work two. And then uh, the first part of uh, these threads is basically acquiring the necessary mutex locks. So as you can see here, uh, thread one is uh, waiting for the first mutex and then the second mutex in the first part of the thread. In the second thread, it is uh, waiting for the second mutex to be released by the first uh, thread and then it waits for the first mutex to be released by the first thread. So when this happens, uh, these threads will wait indefinitely for the, the other one to release the mutex or the lock that it is waiting for. But uh, you also have to remember that uh, the, the deadlock will happen or the possibility that the deadlock will happen will be dependent on the thread scheduler because for example uh, if the thread scheduler executed this and then immediately executed this okay, then there will be a deadlock but if the thread scheduler executed this this first and then immediately this and then it waits for this then the deadlock may not happen so the scheduler the third scheduler can also be a factor in uh, the possibility of a deadlock happening so given the conditions that uh, we've said we can also study deadlocks uh, by observing a uh, resource allocation graph. What is this resource allocation graph? Uh, you represent the system model as composed of vertices and edges and the vertex set V is partitioned, further partitioned into two sets. You have the process set and you have the resources set and uh, given these two sets we also define a request edge and assignment edge so the request edge is a directed edge symbolized by this notation so process i is uh, requesting for resource j and the assignment a edge is denoted by this you have the resource j assigned to process i visually uh, we represent the process as a circle 
uh, a resource type as a rectangle with the number of instances as a smaller rectangles inside the bigger uh, resource type rectangle uh, and graphically also or visually uh, this is how we represent uh, process I requesting an instance of RJ so notice the arrow the arrow uh, head is only up to the boundary of the resource type whereas the assignment uh, edge uh, the tail of the arrow uh, originates from the particular instance of a resource type. So in this case, let's say we number the instance as instance 1, instance 2, instance 3, instance 4. Uh, it says, it clearly shows here that instance 1 is assigned to process I. So here we have a an example of a resource allocation graph wherein we have uh, three processes p1 p2 and p3 and we have four resources resource resource one and resource three uh, they have only one instance resource two has two instances and resource four has uh, three instances so given this uh, graph can we tell by just visually observing uh, the resource allocation location graph whether there is uh, or uh, the state of the system at this moment in time is in a deadlock state Okay, uh, given the definition of a resource allocation graph, okay, uh, if the graph or the rug has no cycle, then uh, there is no deadlock in the system. If you can't find a cycle, remember uh, our definition of cycle in COMSAI 57 and COMSAI 123. So, uh, in this example, uh, resource allocation graph, we can actually have several cycles. So for example, we have P1. So starting at P1, uh, 1, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's a cycle. Okay? And we can have a cycle like this also, this uh, uh, set here. Okay, so this is one cycle, this is another cycle, bigger cycle. Okay? So, if there is no cycle in the resource allocation graph, we are sure that there is no deadlock. But, what if we have a cycle in the resource allocation graph? Does it automatically mean that there is a deadlock in the system if you have a cycle? So it is not necessary that if you have a cycle in the resource allocation graph, there is already a deadlock. Okay? So in this example, Okay. So in this example, uh, there is no cycle, so we're sure that there is no deadlock. Here, there are two cycles, okay? and we know that there is deadlock in this uh, graph. Okay? Why is there a deadlock? in this graph okay so at this point uh, p3 is waiting for a resource that are currently held by p2 and p1 okay and uh, but p1 is requesting 
for this resource. So it's you have here the hold and wait condition. Okay. Hold and wait condition. Uh, you have mutual exclusion. Okay. And then you have uh, no preemption. So this resource can only be released by P1. This resource instance can only be re released by uh, P2. Okay, so that's no preemption. And then there is circular weight. Okay, so this part here, uh, you have a circular weight. And therefore, given this resource allocation graph, you have all of the conditions happening. So there is a deadlock. Okay. Now, in this second graph, you see a cycle, right? So you see a cycle here. It's a cycle. Okay. But it does not necessarily mean that there is a deadlock in this uh, system. Because at some point in time, P4 will release this instance, thereby granting P3 access to this instance. So the deadlock will not happen. Because, for example, P4 is not waiting for any other resource. After it completes its operation using this resource, it will release the resource and P3 can get hold of this resource instance. Okay? So, to summarize, if a graph contains no cycles, then there are, there's no deadlock. But if a graph contains a cycle, and there is only one instance per resource type, then there is deadlock. But if several, there are several instances of a resource type, there is a possibility of a deadlock. So there is... Uh, just a possibility, especially if you have several instances of a resource type. So I hope that's clear. So uh, the next part is handling deadlocks. Okay, so uh, we have defined our system model. We have stated the four conditions of a deadlock must, ha must happen simultaneously. We've represented our system model using a resource allocation graph. And uh, using visual inspection, we can tell whether a system is uh, in a deadlock state. If depending on the presence or absence of a cycle in the resource allocation graph. Now, what if we uh, have a deadlock? How do we handle deadlocks then? So, the first approach is to ensure that the system will never enter a deadlock state. So, to do that, there are two approaches. You prevent the deadlock from happening. And the second one is to avoid the deadlock from happening. So, these are two uh, different approaches for ensuring that the system will never enter a deadlock state. The second option is to allow the system to enter a deadlock state and then recover. Okay, so you allow the system. Uh, so in a way, you, you will expect that the system will uh, a deadlock will happen in the system. And then you detect that deadlock and then you recover from it. And the last option is just ignoring that a deadlock will happen and uh, pretend that it, it will never happen. So most operating systems will try to uh, try to uh, actually implement this approach. So it's up to the uh, developer of applications to make sure that they write programs that are uh, deadlock free. Okay, so we'll stop here for a while.